Welcome everyone. My name is Olga Leshevska and uh, I work as a postdoc in Ireland. So I will going to show you how machine learning can be applied in sciences. And after a previous talk, if you've been here, we had some nice introduction about all kinds of ensemble methods. So here I'm going to show you one specific case on uh, gradient boosting. Okay, so um, here's the background of the problem. In the past uh, 60 years, we observed decline in the size of fish by about four centimeters on average. So you think about herring, which is about 20 centimeters long, four centimeters is a lot of, a lot of uh, reduction. So we would like to find out what's the problem, why is it happening, and we're going to use machine learning to answer this question. So why is it a problem? It's because herring is a very important species for consumption. And we know that if it does decrease, it has the consequences for further stock production, so it means there will be less fish in the future, so we can consume less. And we don't know what's causing decline, but we are presuming there is an interactive effect of various uh, factors, such as uh, sea surface temperature may change. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Or uh, zooplankton abundance may change, f fish abundance may change, or fish pressure. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, so uh, to answer this question, I'm going to use data from... Uh, uh, for the past uh, 60 years, from 1959 uh, to 2012, um, and the data is spread throughout the year. Um, don't stop me. I'm sorry. It's all in. It's all in. I don't touch it. I won't touch it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use this data, and uh, the way data has been uh, collected. Is, uh, it has been collected from commercial vessels from uh, uh, taken at random, 50 to 100 samples at a time. And uh, total sample size is about 15,000 uh, individual fishes. So imagine a data set of 50,000 rows. Um, just one button. Okay, so study area, this is where the data comes from. It's called Celtic Seas, just on the south of the Ireland, and it's bounded by uh, St. George Channel, English Channel, and uh, so it's just, uh, you can imagine where we are now. So it's about uh, study area size. And uh, so objective is to uh, identify important factors which underlie this problem. And to answer this question, I'm going to use a gradient boosting regression trees, which is one of the uh, ensemble algorithms which uh, are available these days. Uh, why ensemble is because we don't have a collection of we don't have one tree, but we have a collection of trees. So, uh, and the final uh, model is, uh, uh, curious of the final model is improved because we have a collection of interlinked trees. So in this case, uh, as opposed to uh, other methods such as uh, bagging or uh, a regression uh, uh, or a random forest where trees are independent, in uh, this method, all trees are dependent in a way that a residual of one tree, so unexplained part of the model, is enters as an input into the next tree. So we have a sequence of interconnected trees, which is a nice feature. It allows to reduce variance. It allows to reduce bias. The only problem with this is because of the interlinked and sequential, we can't paralyze uh, our algorithm because they all depend on each other. Okay, so, uh, so advantages of gradient boosting regression trees are basically more or less the same as those of other ensemble methods, which means, uh, just to mention a few, we can detect uh, nonlinear feature interaction. It's just because of the underlying feature selection uh, uh, which is going on in the algorithm. Uh, it is resistant to inclusion of relevant features, which means we can include as many variables as we like, and if they're irrelevant, they won't be selected, so we don't care. Okay, so which is nice. Uh, it, is, it is good uh, if we deal with uh, data on a different scale. Uh, we don't have to standardize data. We may, have, we may wish to standardize, but we don't have to because they are robust. And if we, for instance, use a normal uh, like linear regression, our model will explode. So in these cases, this is a really good advantage. Uh, also robust to outliers, so if there are any data points which are not fitting data, maybe because it's a mistake or maybe some special event, we don't care at all. It's more accurate, and we can use different loss functions, like, for instance, least square or others, which is uh, implementation gradient boosting regression trees, which is nice. Okay, disadvantage is it requires careful tuning. It takes a lot of time to get uh, good models. It's slow to train, but very fast to predict. And I'll show you, after I finish my uh, talk, part of my talk, I'll show you implementation in my Python notebook, uh, how I did it. Okay, so a little bit of uh, equations here. So the formal specification of the model 
uh, we have, uh, it is a, an additive model. So we have a, a sequence of trees and uh, each tree is uh, weighted uh, so that it, uh, it, as, as we get a, a sample of trees, they all combine through this uh, gamma weight as you can see here, okay? And each individual tree is shown as on this part of the equation. And then we build an additive model in a forward stage wise fashion. So, so as I said, we add each tree sequentially with uh, this parameter epsilon, which is shrinkage, also known as learning rate. You know, we all talk about learning rate, this is a learning rate. So a learning rate allows to control uh, uh, speed, how fast we descend along the gradient. And finally, at each stage, the weak learner is chosen to minimize some loss function. In my case, I took uh, least square because it's a natural choice, but it can be any other function which you can uh, uh, differentiate. And this, uh, this part of the model uh, is evaluated by uh, negative gradient descent, okay? I won't go into details of that, but that's uh, all about formality in my talk. Okay, so parameters which I finally selected, in my case, I needed about 500 iterations and uh, learning rate of about 0 0.05. Um, these two parameters I uh, refer to as um, regularization parameters, okay? And they affect degree of fit and they, therefore they affect the value of each other, which is a bit complicated because uh, if I increase a number of iterations, let's say by a factor of 10, it doesn't mean that learning rate will decrease by a factor of 10. It's not proportional, so which is difficult. You, you may increase uh, iterations, but your learning rate might decrease by a different proportion and that's why it's getting tricky. Okay, so next parameter is maximum uh, tree depth, which is in my case six. Uh, for this particular algorithm is known from theory and from different simulation models that uh, uh, tree trunks, so it means that uh, with one split only, perform best. Okay, which is nice, so we don't need any deep trees, but in some cases uh, you may need uh, from four to six, or maximum eight, uh, uh, eight, uh, 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 three, uh, eight uh, splits, okay? In my case, it's six. It means that my model can accommodate up to five uh, interactions, okay? This is what it means. Okay, next parameter is subsample. In my case, it's 75%. It's an optional. If you specify anything less than one, it means that you get a stochastic model. So we introduce some randomness. Uh, it can be nice because it allows to reduce variance and uh, reduce bias, and uh, practically I found out that this was a better result, therefore I introduced. So uh, basically my model is stochastic gradient boosting regression tree, to be precise. Okay, and loss function is least squares. As I mentioned, it's a natural choice, nice to start with, easy to interpret, but it can be any other loss functions, and they're nicely implemented in scikit-learn, and uh, it's very easy to change it. Okay, so if we estimate our model, in this case, I uh, split my data in three parts. Uh, in, uh, if I have enough time, I'll show you how I did it split in two parts. I also have results, and they're very similar, which is nice, shows robustness of my model. But in this case, I, um, I split data 50% for train, 25 test, 25 validation. There is no particular reason why, because I have 50,000 rows, I, can, I, just, uh, I just can. If you have less data, you don't. You may choose for maybe one leave out or cross-validation or some other methods which are more uh, uh, specific for smaller data sets, but I have a big data set. And you can see I have um, MSC's mean squared error, which is degree of accuracy. Well, it's rather low, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy enough with my model, and I can see that after some interactions, uh, my model um, flattened out, so uh, there is no big, uh, there is no change in uh, MSC, which means that I have enough iterations. And R square tells me a uh, proportion of variance which is explained by model. And uh, for trains that is slightly higher, uh, which may indicate a bit of overfitting, but it's not a big gap in between them, so I, uh, I'm uh, satisfied. And, uh, but these all values uh, follow each other very closely, so it means that on average my model is doing a good job. Okay? And there is some, um, if, if I reduce variability in data, I see that R square goes up, so there is basically an uh, effect of that. So a little bit of results. So I plot here uh, length of the fish. On x-axis, um, you can see that it's maybe around uh, from 20 to 30 centimeters, uh, imagine. And uh, my model predicts fish from 22 to 28. So basically, it is what it says. On average, we give a correct value. If you have extremes too small or too, uh, too big, they won't be predicted correctly, okay? So it's 50% of the R-square, what's uh, reflected on this graph. 
Okay, and if you want to find out which variables play a role in, uh, in my model, this is what I wanted to find out. Uh, uh, the, the way it's performed is uh, each variable is used, well, the most important one is used to split a tree. The more often it's used to split a tree, if we count times it's used, we can say, okay, then it means it's more important. In this case, I have a color coding here, so this first is a trend, it's basically a month Okay, so we know there is some trend in data, and as soon as it reduced it, I could see it's uh, in 100% uh, cases it has been used. After that, we have sea surface temperature, uh, which is, uh, I'll show you next graph how it's affected, but it's basically there is some relationship. And uh, other things are food availability, so if there is enough food in the sea, and uh, uh, abundance of fish, so how, how many, how, how large is the population, etc. So most important message here is to remember that trend is important one, and after that we have uh, sea surface temperature and uh, and food, okay? So if we uh, further visualize those three variables in the partial dependence plots, so um, the first row here is a one-way partial dependence plots, uh, basically where I plot uh, each feature against uh, our my uh, 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 dependent variable, which is the length of the fish, we can see that uh, we can't really see any uh, particular relationship here. It doesn't say relationship, but it shows a, a degree of interaction is the way how it uh, uh, depends on each other. So we don't really pick up any dependence here, but we do pick up here. So I highlighted here with the circles these two areas. Um, um, it means that maybe if you, if you can see here about 14 degrees, so if uh, sea surface temperature uh, is below 14 degrees, there is a positive relationship. So fish gets larger. So fish likes uh, temperature up to 14 degrees in this case. If it gets too warm, fish, uh, there is a negative relationship. So it, does, it, 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 it definitely shows uh, some kind of dependence between length of the fish and the temperature. Um, well, I don't want to talk about uh, climate change here because uh, it's a very debatable issue, but you can imagine if temperature, you know, global warming, if temperature goes up, it may have an effect on the fish and uh, on us eventually because we can't consume fish we like, okay? So this is an interesting message. And finally, um, here, this is one of the uh, food sources. In this particular case, it's phytoplankton, it's what fish eats. Uh, if you focus on this area, uh, well, well, why I focus here, not focus here, because um, uh, my, most of my data is concentrated over here, as you see, because these little ticks are deciles, so it's where data is concentrated. Uh, it may go up to here just because uh, I have uh, some outlier, but I don't care because I know my model is robust, so just I don't interpret this part. So if I look at this part, I don't see any dependence. I think it's just because in this case uh, uh, it's not a limiting factor. Obviously, if we have less uh, food, it will affect, but in case of Celtic Sea, there is a lot of uh, phytoplankton, so fish doesn't, is not dependent on that. Okay, and then the second row here, we have a two-way interaction plot is where I plot each uh, feature against uh, each other, it's just to, find, to see if I can pick up any interaction between those. I'm sorry. Okay, so we can see here it's basically the same story. We see sort of temperature about 14 degrees here. We see that something is happening. So uh, uh, what it says, this analysis tells me, well, I know there, is, there are important features, but I can't really say why is it. So uh, by, the, by the fact that trend is important, it tells me that I might need to go and use maybe time series modeling to find out the way it depends. So I can't answer this question with machine learning. All I can do is uh, to pick up these features out of the bunch of other features on the big data set, and it's as far as it goes. So there are limitations to uh, how you can apply it. And so conclude, we see that there are three important features, which are in this case trend, which is time trend, sea surface temperature and food availability. Something is going on with temperature, which is clearly about 14 degrees, and um, there is a higher degree of interaction between these features. And remember that with this method, we can't uh, find the cause-effect relationship but we have a relative importance of the variable. So from a bunch of variables, I picked up the ones which are more important. And I can take, away, uh, take it with me for the next uh, type of uh, analysis. Um, okay, so uh, this is the first part of my talk, and uh, I'm not sure how much time I have. I would like to show you um, uh, a little bit how it has been implemented. Um, okay, I have five minutes. Uh, so it's basically a first part of this is uh, what I've shown you in my presentation. It's a three-way split. Um, of my data set. So I'll go a bit quicker here. Is it large enough? 
Okay, so um, you know I, I'm sure it's all familiar to you. Uh, it's I import all libraries um, to be reproducible because I work in sciences. I need to set seed because I want to run it again and get the same results. Okay, I read the data and I see here about about 50,000 rows and about 15 features uh, in my case. Um, I haven't discussed this, but uh, I do check uh, multicollinearity, which means if I have two features which are really uh, dependent um, for normal regression, uh, with like where I have one tree only, it may, uh, it, it, it not may, it will for sure blow your model. Uh, you can't allow that uh, in your model. For um, assemble methods, for this particular algorithm, it doesn't matter. But if you can detect uh, multicollinearity, it's better to take out variables which are if, um, you know, which are multicollinear. So it's basically how I do it here. I construct a matrix of Pearson, well, product moment correlation coefficient, that's what's it called. And uh, I uh, um, get it here, and I can find out which variables, so the higher uh, uh, multicollinearity, uh, the more intensive color. It's basically, uh, there is no rule, but everything above 80% uh, or 0 0.8 may indicate multicollinearity. So I see here, this is either red or dark color, so it's basically those variables I just took out of my model, okay? And uh, this one as well. Okay, so I remove them, and uh, I do three-way split, so 50%, 25, 25 for each part of the model, and, and I fit my model. Okay, so uh, this is the final parameters, but it took me a few, uh, a few iterations for sure to uh, be satisfied with what I have. And, uh, how I found out how many estimators I need here, because uh, the usual rule is to set learning rate as low as possible and to get a number of estimators with number three as high as possible. And if you do that, your model will run forever, but you for sure end up with something uh, feasible and then you can start playing around by reducing, okay? Uh, how I found out this 500 is I used apply algorithm is, which is called early stopping and it's uh, available in scikit-learn. Uh, it comes a little bit uh, later on. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not sure. I don't touch it. No. Okay, I just touch a button. Uh, just push down. So. Okay, and it's the same graph again, you've seen it before. And again, uh, I think what's, Im what's interesting is to show quickly uh, other part of, um, so this is early stopping which I mentioned earlier. Uh, other part, when we do a two-way split, because two-way split is something which is done, uh, to my opinion, more often than three-way split. Uh, uh, in two-way split, you only have train and test, you don't have validation set. Okay, um, and uh, to identify parameters for this part, I used the grid search. So I specified the range of parameters. You can specify for all p parameters you like, but I only took uh, regularization parameters because those are most uh, uh, difficult ones. So I specify here maximum depths, which I know I had six, so I took uh, one to the right, one to the left, and I know from theory that it shouldn't be higher than eight, so I don't go there. Okay, and uh, learning rate, I have 0 0.5 now. 0.05, and I, I want to increase or decrease and see how it works. So what happens is that we, give a, we, give, we get a, um, a confusion matrix, uh, not confusion, but we have a matrix of different combination of parameters, and each time we feed the model, we run, we run, we run, and eventually the one which gives uh, highest accuracy is chosen, and it tells me which parameters I should take. So you can see here output is best hyperparameters. It says that learning rate should be uh, 10% or 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.05, and max depth can be a bit more shallow, but it's very close, okay? And close, if I fit those parameters and all other parameters I uh, keep, uh, keep the same, I, what I get is very similar results. Again, here you can see it's about 50% or 52% for train and test data, which is good, okay? So again, we, we see the same graph, which is good. It means I have... Um, same algorithm, but I uh, apply it to different types of data partitioning. One time I did three-way split with early stopping to find a number of iterations. In other way, I split in two, uh, in two parts and I used grid search to find the best parameters. I change parameters and still my model does, uh, I think I have to finish, <laughs> my model does give similar results, which is good, it means uh, algorithm is robust. Okay, I think I will stop here because it's not uh, doing very well. So thank you very much for your attention.
you have questions? Yeah, do I have any questions? Okay. <coughs> Uh, did you compare the results with uh, any random forest trees? Um, I, I, I ran some results with uh, just a normal random forest and uh, uh, mean square there is slightly higher. I didn't tell here because I, I was a bit uh, stressed with all this uh, thing, but I did a normal least square regression and uh, uh, again it does uh, show that the uh, model does, uh, is, is less accurate, so yes, I did compare. Okay. And do you have the data or the notebook available? Yes, it's on my GitHub. You can see uh, okay. if you put my cool. surname, uh, it's over there. Yes. Thank you. Another question? No? OK. Uh, maybe. So um, you said there was a link between the temperature and the fish. Yes. Does that help you then get another grant to do more research? Is that is that kind of the aim of this? To yes, uh, basically this was a kind of a press study. Uh, we are interested to find out if there are, uh, in terms of, because it's a time series data for 60 years, which is very unique in science, as you know, it's a long-term uh, collection. So we wanted to find out which variables are more important so that we can reduce our data set to most relevant ones, and then I could take and do some kind of multivariate time series analysis, yes. Yep, no one? Okay, thank, thank you, Olga. I'm sorry for quality of... Uh, it's not your fault. I know, it's computer. <laughs> <laughs> Always blame machines. <laughs>